Thank you also. I didn't know he was in jail. Uh, David, when, when did Surovikin got, got jailed? I shouldn't, uh, sorry, and I shouldn't say in jail. He's some form of, of his, 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 I don't know if he's a house arrest. Uh, I don't think it's jail, uh, but he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's in custody, let's say. He's in custody, but we, we don't know what, which, form of, uh, which form that is. I mean, you mean the police have him or, uh, or? Yeah, apparently the intelligence services are questioning him still. Okay, well, that could mean anything. There's a, let's go for a cup of coffee. Tell us what you did. Uh, or or, or uh, it's a, let, we're going to pull your fingernails out. Depends. Well, mm. so I did not know that, anything about this though. Okay, so we learned something new today. Um, we learned something new every day. Uh, but since Abdullah uh, put his hand down, I will, I will ask you a question, David, because I saw a picture. I, I mentioned earlier the wounded of, of the Russian uh, of the Russian troops, and you have seen in Ukraine how much care, um, how much care the Ukrainians uh, give to, to their wounded, and also the fact that um, everybody is trying to pull in order to get best aid, best um, treatment, best, uh, I don't know, everything from bandages to, to uh, antibiotics. So, there was a picture in Ukraine, in, uh, in um, Twitter about the um, Russian soldiers uh, who were wounded. And the statement was the following. Um, the, the superior officers are being sent home to be treated and the, the um, uh, soldiers are being treated uh, locally uh, without anesthetic because they actually don't have enough anesthetic. Uh, how many times, David, in battle as, as a soldier, um, did you have one of your um, people, one of the people from, your from the troops uh, you were in from the unit you were in. How many times uh, do you see? Do you saw them um, wounded? Well, I've, uh, there's only three of uh, three uh, guys in the sections I've been who've been badly uh, wounded. Uh, but listen, I've read the same article. Uh, the uh, it's uh, it's a bit astonishing that the bit that they're treating uh, treating those soldiers uh, the, with without anaesthetic, without drugs without antibiotics and so the survival rate will be really low imagine imagine someone cutting your leg off without the aid of uh, of um some form of painkiller other than paracetamol and be a, that might be enough to kill you so this is basically first world world first world war uh, or no, worse. not even that in, in, in <laughs> it, with regards to that so if you were in in they had things like morphine in the first world war and the second world war so the uh, so this i think you're going back to uh, the, uh, the the you need to go back to the battle of balaclava and that well-known uh, nurse there that's the level of nursing and and medicine that you're talking about uh, interestingly, uh, on Crimea as well, right? So, I cannot help but thinking, and I'm sorry. Um, I was talking earlier about corruption, and I've read so many accounts when soldiers, uh, Russian soldiers needed to give money to someone in order to get something. So, 
I cannot help but think, David, if they really don't have the anesthetic or the guys who are operated uh, don't have the money to pay for it, to pay the doctor. Uh, well, I don't know, unless someone is there, who knows? I mean, the, there's been stories of of soldiers who've been kicked out of hospitals because the, because the, you know, they didn't have what was taken or needed for the drugs and the rest of it. You go, what? Hang on. The, uh, surely this is the state pays for this, but apparently not. I don't. I mean, I I don't know enough about it. I would be very interested to know. Uh, uh, but we hear all sorts of stories about people raising money to buy, you know, to send the drugs to the hospitals. The hospitals are probably stealing it. They may even be cutting down uh, the the drugs that are being sent to you, so they'll sell that on elsewhere. Uh, it's just one. This is what happens in corrupt societies, and especially societies that see human beings as commodities. It's just a, what's the earning potential out of these sick people here? Yeah. And, and uh, you said, started saying something. <laughs> yes. Um, um, I was thinking about... Uh, you know, you have to have a, a level of subhuman, right? So these are um, doctors and sometimes officers uh, who know really well what they do. Um, and letting someone um, suffer as a dog near to you um, because they don't have the money to pay, t to pay you um uh, that's that's a, a a different level of of lowness if if that makes sense that it you have to to not have a heart 100% you have to not have a heart it's impossible for you to look at someone and and to operate on on live um to operate live that person uh, without anesthetic if you know you can give it just because he doesn't have the money so yeah uh, what can i say <laughs> it is sometimes it's uh it's troubling how low people can go but on the other side um i was discussing with my grandma uh, in, I think it was October last year, September or October last year. And I was telling her, you know, this is in Ukraine, this happens, you know, this and that, um, the shelling, the rape, the pilgrimage, the, the, everything that, you know, um, I was aware through the space and, and through Twitter and everything. And she was like, I know. Like, she, 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 when, when she wanted, she said something like, Mama, let's, uh, uh, which is like saying to someone, um, dear, let, let me tell you something. Um, I saw all that life. So in the Second World War, right? Um, and it's unfortunate because 80 years have passed. And I, I said this in the space this morning. It's like a, a lingering thought today. Whenever people say um, Russia and, and Ukraine is the same, they are not the same. Not the same people not the same uh, um, nation and not the same care for their people, not the same attention, um, help, um, generosity to other human beings. It's, it's the difference between them, looking at them, how, how they fight, looking at them, how they care, 
about the soldiers. And I, I, I'm not doubting that there are um, relatives of the soldiers who are fighting in Ukraine, uh, of the Russian soldiers who are fighting in Ukraine, who actually suffer for them and, and send them money as much as they can and, and try to help them. But the vast majority, right? The vast majority, it's astounding the lack of care for another human being which is suffering and actually it's from your own nation so it's not even from a different nation we care about ukraine and ukraine is not our nation right uh, we care about ukraine because as a principle you help someone who is being attacked but yeah uh, time and again today, I, I came back to this thought. They are not the same. In each and every aspect, I think, they are not the same. So, yeah. Uh, we have up two people. Um, Lily, I, I saw you came up, and also Miko. Um, do you want to add something on, on this topic as uh, we, David and I, I, I was taking the place of Axel and try to, you know, uh, stand here on the balcony and, and <laughs> um, I, need a, I need a stick, David. I need, the, I have the spectacles, I need a stick. Um, G-Man, <laughs> you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Anda. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is just so uh, resonant to things that I've heard in this last year. Um, I attended, um, I have a mutual follow, I will step back, I, I'm in a, a history group, uh, an online one run by a comedian in the UK, Al Murray. He's also a historian because he's actually written some real books on history uh, and also the other military historian. James Holland. So they, they set up this online history group during COVID, during lockdown, um, called We Have Ways of Making You Talk. It's a bit of a, a play on the Second World War. Um, and anyway, um, I got invited to um, a conference through a friend in Poland called Alina, who's also in this group. And um, the conference was on Holocaust, um, and it was the organization running it was is called the Lemkin Center. Um, Lemkin being the Polish philosopher, lawyer, lawyer. That's the one. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, who invented who genocide? He basically created the definition of genocide. Um, so I'm, yeah, I got to listen to that. There was some really, really good speakers, including friends of the space Ian Gardner, a Canadian. Um, so some really good speakers. I'm just trying to remember there, but they had, um, they had a number of people from Ukraine and a number of people that have been working in Ukraine on, um, documentation of the atrocities. And what's going to be needed? Um, so the Lemkin Center, if you look it up, if you look them in, they do have um, some case studies. And I'm trying to think of the other. Um, I've got too many tabs open on both my iPad and my computer, my Mac. Um, there's another organization um, who are in a similar uh, Victim advocacy, that's, I think is the term called galuku.net, um, I think their, their name is. Um, anyway, sorry, that's some rambling a little bit, but there was some of the, the memory of people after the Second World War from Poland and even and Germany and other, well, effectively every entity and every country that the Soviet army, the Red Army passed through, 
they devastated like a plague of locusts between taking people for their army they they conscripted as they went uh, taking food and everything they needed and also uh, raping and murdering and just people explain it away as it's just the way it happens just the russian way of fighting soviet way of fighting russian way it's the same thing um so yeah yeah that's so what's i mean this is it you know you're in eastern europe your grandmother already a grand your grandmother especially already knows what they're like Well, what I can confirm one thing. So, when Russians entered Romania in 1944, um, they raped everything um, in in Moldova um, on on the uh, western side of the Prut. Um, simply horrible stories simply horrible stories so yeah uh and indeed they they went to uh, to sellers uh and asked about uh wine and everything um and and stole everything they could take from from the houses of the people who were uh in uh, on on that land and you have to remember when they entered Romania, uh, they were our allies, right? We on the 23rd of August, uh, Romania changed sides from um, from from uh, uh, from our alliance with the with the Germans. Uh, we changed sides uh, and. Um, had an accord with the allies uh, so when russians entered romania we were allies basically and they still did that so um yeah this is this is who they are this is who they are what they what they can do they have no pity for anyone so yeah uh lily um welcome up do you have a question i just wanted to say hi to you Anna. <laughs> and david <clears throat> no uh, i i would like to respond to g-man but i've spoken about this before a friend of mine who survived the concentration camps and her husband did too they were fiance and they were from Debreton, um, Hungary, and only uh, hus her husband survived Bergen Belsen, but both of them um, lost their grand, uh, not lost, I don't like using that word. Their grandparents were killed by the Nazis <laughs> and they survived. And when they went back to their town, Debreton, uh, after the camps were liberated, they have the Russians there that an agreement had been made, I guess, at some point. I have that those facts written down about that agreement there. Um, but anyway, um, they escaped from, so they got married and had two children, the living under Russian occupation after they survived the concentration camps was so horrible. She was a very tiny, petite, beautiful woman and um they learned though in the camps like they wouldn't go as a woman alone in the streets uh, especially in front of the russians who have taken over their country as well and escaped them but if uh, she was there and other hungarian men they would hide her if the russian soldiers uh, were coming by because they knew that they would grab her to rape her. And 
um, they couldn't trust the postman. No, everyone was on, as we say, the ear listening. They couldn't even play cards without closing their curtains and looking all the time. Just card, not gambling. Um, but anyway, uh, what I really wanted, and I could, so I think that's for right now. And then I want to go back to you and David were speaking about the um, poor care for the Russian soldiers and uh, no proper care. So a while ago here, uh, maybe it was David, Doman, Echo, I was asking about mobile hospitals on the Russian side and whether or not there is such a thing, but someone had instructed me that uh, when they um, have now taken over Ukrainian land and murdered, that they took control of the hospitals in the region. So they probably were, let's say, working out of there, um, working, you know, I don't know what kind of care they were given to their, their people. But eventually, all of the drugs that are in a hospital are replaced daily because there is such a huge use of certain drugs. So they would be gone at this point unless there is a pharmaceutical uh, industry in Russia, which I don't know of. I guess I can read on that. I will. But if they have a huge industry uh, that can produce antibiotics, blood thinners, you know, a lot of things go into this. So, um, and so that would be gone unless they're getting fresh infusion of necessary um, drugs and supplies out in the field, like David was saying, <laughs> taking someone's leg off, you know, that's the old give someone a block of wood to bite on. However, um, you know, amputation of, let's just say, a leg, whether it's an arm or what have you, but it's not just, um, you know, I don't know if people know, but, you know, you, you go through tissue, you then actually use a striker saw, a rotating blade to saw the bone. Um, the tibia, the large bone in the uh, distal leg, is quite strong. That's how we're able to walk, God willing, until a hundred, right? For us here, and, uh, and, and it has a whole a, a, a huge amount of blood in it as well, right? So yes, yes. So what? That's so. I yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I was talking slow, David. Yes, I'll talk faster. But I wanted to get to that too. So uh, bones are so full of blood. Just think about it. Like we have healthy bone that's strong, and it responds to exercise uh david uh, being an athlete uh on the if you walk you know every time we're walking the bones get stronger where they should there's force plates it's a little physics but there's blood right and we have a lot of cells and so that bleeding it's not just taking the limb off it is hemostasis, keeping as much of your blood in your body. And that's not just putting a big bulky bandage. And so I don't know what kind of, uh, I mean, you have to uh, suture or tie off a large uh, arteries and uh, veins. Uh, so it's not just um, a simple thing. <laughs> and even under the most sterile conditions in the operating room in the theater, um, post-op day one or two, you can often see something that looks a little bit off, even though it looks red and angry, that's normal, but sometimes you'll see, oh, that looks like it could be a little skin infection, a little cellulitis, and then you start then you add in a different antibiotic. So it usually goes away in a day because you see it so soon. Just, I mean, I imagine the death from the actual injury for them fighting Ukrainians, that's a loss. But the numbers of these people that have had these procedures done is going to be astronomical. I mean, it'll be very fascinating to me. I'm not saying fascinating that people go through this. I am not a war gung-ho person, but I do want all the Russians to be killed if they're killing and raping Ukrainians. So, um, but anyway, just down to the biology of it. And um, 
I can't see them. I, I, I just can't. It goes against what we know uh, for um, good health and surgical intervention. I see, and I'm really glad you came up, Lily. Uh, simply uh, because uh, that when I was I was thinking it through and going, because you just named a couple of drugs, right? Uh, things that are so important when you have these types of injuries, right? Blood thinners, right? Yeah, antibiotics. It's not just one antibiotic. There's a range of them, right? It's not just a tablet. Maybe infused, right? And you were telling me about the other uh, versions of that where you go the water and the jet sprays uh, they we're That's pretty right, certain they, mm -hmm. they, but they mm -hmm. but we're pretty certain they don't have that right but there's a whole range of these things and you was going god i mean it's, i'm just going the survival rate in hospital must be very low right and you're the looking at this very low i'm sorry i didn't mean to shout like that yes no feel very free low. yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very low to have a patient expire um, because of a, uh, a poor procedure as far as removing infection or doing a amputation. I actually have, you may die, all of us may die if you have a surgery, sometimes you get a, a blood clot that travels, that's that other drug we were talking about. You always have an anticoagulant during this time. But and you don't have also, this in field hospitals uh, all the time, even in Vietnam and uh, uh, first Gulf War, second Gulf War, Afghanistan and remote locations. Field hospital care is a different thing. It's sometimes extremely difficult. But that's what we're, no. we're not talking about we're, that though, we're not, Axel. We're talking yeah, about uh, an article know, that was uh, written. No, it's fine. Uh, the uh, we were talking about an article that was uh, that has been written. That's what the conversation was about, Axel. Sorry, I thought it sounded as if we were talking about. No, that. I know, right? But this is what happens when you don't listen to it all. No, right? I can't. So yeah, Sorry. look, it's <laughs> yes. It's very important, right? So the point we were trying to make is that the survival rate of Ru uh, Russian soldiers, by the time they've been, if they even get to the hospital, is going to be very low because, right, they don't have enough. Uh, they're not don't have enough of the uh, of the stuff they need. And as Lily go, look, uh, the, the you think of the number of different interventions that would be needed for someone in hospital. And that's just like, oh, cut that off. And as Lily was going, imagine like you, you've got, you've lost a leg just above the knee or no, halfway up the knee, the, the lo blood loss from there. How are they getting that blood? Where do they the plasma from it? And, oh, and all okay, the other so things. This is the article from today about the additional losses which the mm. Russians are suffering, mm. given the fact that they have such bad care. That's true. The, the, but and that's what I know. It's, I know it's true, Axel. It's also, <laughs> no, it's also one thing which is spared out in this article is the distance to the first point of uh, care. Then the second is actually the, the transportation uh, to the field uh, hospital. And no, the lack uh, of field uh, hospital. but I know, Axel. Uh, but, but you. But th this is the stuff that I was going to discuss. Right. So, yes, it's good. I'm glad you read it. Right. So. But yes. Uh, well, thank you very much for that permission. <laughs> yeah, look, it's incredible. Right. So the point is, is that they, there is no golden hour for them and the uh, all of the other things to it. And then part of the article goes into it. Uh, anyone who hasn't read it, I will try and put it. Uh, I, I think I tried to put it in the, the nest a little bit earlier. Um, but uh, the uh, uh, so you uh Officers are getting repatriated into Russia for treatment and the people who aren't officers getting to stay. And uh, there are reports. So these are different reports where they've they've um, opened up school gyms, etc., to use them, uh, those as, as hospitals and wards. And Im imagine, Lily, imagine the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the sanitized areas they're going to have in a school gym. David, you you have a, a I don't know, like a static um, clicking uh, sound. Yeah, clicking. Uh, like a it, popping sound. Like a, I don't know. I've just just got my same same headphones on that I normally have. It was like you had a popcorn maker. No, oh, not me. Oh, maybe it is. Maybe maybe uh, maybe it's Elon. Yes. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> He is the blame for it. today. He's the blame for everything. Um, 
So <laughs> I wanted to chip in with two, two, two things. So there was, um, apart from this article last year, during winter, actually, during winter time, we have had here a discussion in the space and also it was um, related to an article we, we, we read. The statistics that were put out uh, about the survival rate of the Russians during winter, if they were badly injured, uh, it was 50%, which means one person out of two died. And during winter, they did have tremendous losses. And this is one of the reasons. Um, they, they don't have the care that they need in order to um, survive. And I wanted Lily to thank you uh, very much for um, bringing up the, uh, this, this topic and putting everything into context. And also for the previous topic, uh, regarding the Holocaust and um, the uh, what happened in in Hungary, um, which, by the way, was the last country uh, to be purged. Um, so the the Jews from uh, uh, Hungary was the were the last ones who arrived in in Auschwitz and in other places, and. Um, that didn't spare them, so um, they they died just as well as others. Uh, it wasn't um, a wild card, um, but yeah, um, it's something to come home and and to find it somehow um, under occupation. So you're not free, uh, even if you're free. Um, so I I am I'm gonna I'm gonna drop and let Axel up to to the balcony uh, <laughs> to continue the the um, the the evening with David and I wanted to thank you all for this discussion and for tonight uh, thank you David uh, G Man for all the input um, Randy which is uh, still in the space. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us, um, Mr. M, George, um, Axel, um, and and uh, CND fella. Um, thank you, everybody, and Slava Ukraini. Param Slava, and thank you very much, Andrew. Well, uh, we we have hands. Uh, the uh, whilst uh, Axel is coming up to the co-host seat, uh, the. Uh, Oh, CND fellow, you put your hand down. What, 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 oh, I that? thought that was. I thought that was. I thought I, I preempted your uh, your call. Oh well, there you are. So well done. Congrat you you very astutely preempted it. <laughs> <laughs> like a like a good apprentice. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, I was just. I, I came up. I was. I just drove back from. You know my uh, Canada Day festivities, and I'm just kind of listening to this space, and it, and it really brings you back to to reality in a way. And, and it, hello, David. Hello, Axel. Hey, everyone. And uh, it is the first time hearing you as a host. I hope you're still listening. Uh, really, thank you. Thank you for your thoughts, your th your time. Uh, you're an excellent host. Uh, you're you're ec you're perfect for this space. And uh, I wanna I wanted to thank you for that your observations like they're real they were real to me and and on point and about learning like i think you mentioned something about learning something new every day and i mean let's say a couple of years ago like i thought that i knew what war was for in a way you know like i've always been like a you know call me a home student of history but but this space has showed me like the errors in that thought Axel, particularly, <laughs> because of your, your approach, very, very on point, uh, on a few occasions educated me. And the DMs I get after expressing myself and, and stuff like that, I mean, truly, this is one of the best places, like, to get real, honest conversation. I mean, sure, there's the occasional clown that comes up, like, the, like I, was, I was driving in and I listened to you guys, and it was this esoteric guy talking about... Uh, Holy moly, like spirits of the cities and uh, and the focal point of energy of the universe. 
and I think it was lunchtime came in and he just put him right in this place. It was a beautiful thing. Like it's, it's actually working like a unit, right? And, and, and uh, like talking about the horrors of Russian rule and stuff like that. I mean, I can only imagine, I can only imagine, there's no way I could relate. I mean, a lot of people on this space actually remember that stuff. That's, that's crazy. But most of us here, you know, most of us here seem to be good people. You know, I, I, I pledge to bring another listener to this space. David, by the way, I heard your pledge. And uh, this is the way. This is the way I think it should be outside Ukraine. I mean, you military guys, I love you. I'm not military. Uh, I, I love to be educated by military guys. I'm a civilian guy. I'm a hardcore civilian guy, but I'm not military. So that leads me to, oh, and Lillian. Lillian, thanks for, uh, what was it, a great uh, clinical uh, level analysis of the whole, you know, losses on the battlefield and how can the Russians sustain that. Like, this, this is insane. Like, did you have all this knowledge concentrated in one space? So I'm going to ask my question. Uh, Axel will know that I've been dealing with this Vatnik. I'm not going to talk about this Vatnik. I got somebody else that I got to bring up here and then I need some advice with. And it goes very well with what Anda just said. This is a person who is Canadian, very high level Canadian, uh, came in with a Ukrainian passport, has a Ukrainian passport, is technically Ukrainian and now Ukrainian Canadian. But if I mention or tell her that she's Ukrainian, I get lambasted because she's not Ukrainian, she's Hungarian. And something about a story about when the Soviet Union came in and I haven't looked it up yet. I've just, it literally just happened two days ago. So I haven't looked it up. I've just, uh, I said, I'd bring it up on the space. Someone's going to answer me. And there's something that happened between Ukraine and Hungary where the borders shifted back and forth and people were both Ukrainian and Hungarian and then Ukrainian and then Hungarian. So in order for me to kind of, I'm going to look it up, but just to get this kind of feel and to try to fight her disinformation where she's telling me that Hungary is actually has the right approach. And I was unable to answer her because I, I didn't know that history. So that's why. Uh, forget all the, the mumbo jumbo I said. I'm actually here to ask that question. If someone can answer me, thank you very much. And I'm I'm absolutely useless uh, there uh, at, at the uh, C and D fellow. Maybe someone else can answer. I get, it probably was a question for Anda because I came up like it was while Anda was talking. That's when I came up with this question. So, so maybe I'll put it. I'll, maybe I'll I'll shelve the question, and then next time Anda comes up, I'll uh, I'll make sure I ask her. Maybe War Doggo or George has something on it. If, thank you so much. Good evening or good day, depending on. Good evening to are. you, War Doggo. Look, uh, is the same, uh, CND is the same logic as uh, any other country. If you rewind the history and you follow some kind of revisionist approach in who, when, what have said, given, uh, agreed in certain point, you need to redraw them up the whole Europe, right? And that is exactly the thing that uh, was being agreed not to do as the outcome of the Second World War and actually what Russia have broken in, in Ukraine. And in fact, uh, the whole history of uh, after the Second World War and the East Europe and Central Europe in particular, uh, Soviet Union uh, demands for certain territories, uh, they were uh, done under the Soviet Union, several millions uh, army being present in Europe and when there was the Alta conference and there were there were the agreements and there were the Soviet Union demands over certain ter territories actually Hungary was one of the countries uh, who was agreed it was agreed that uh, Soviet Union is reclaiming part of the territory but is is the is the, is the rabbit hole if you follow that logic i mean we don't go anywhere i mean it simply doesn't make sense same as like uh 
any country can start saying something and specifically specifically in order to avoid that countries have been agreed that they don't do that if there is somebody following that logic and they still in kind of this revisionist uh, crap it means they have to go to doctor or they're just playing russian narrative nothing more than that we play football uh, we play soccer we play hockey we are joking on each other in certain specifics but we never go wars one to another is only russians who do so in their imperial crappy mindset but this is this is the way over there this is the same logic just to give you the parallel and i hope this 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 shortly answers your answers your question you no, know, it helps a lot. Thank you very much. It's just, yes, of course, as, as someone who grew up in the West, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around the, the mentality, right? I, it's hard for me to actually conceptualize how could someone be that way, right? That's it. Okay, thank you. Overall, Hungary have, having its phantom pain of the Hungarian uh, Empire, of Austro-Hungarian Empire, but the, the the simple hint back to these guys who are uh playing this re revision is crap is to rewind back the history in their own mind and to regain how they get how they got the idea of their own country uh together with uh with austrian empire so that would come down the guys because they pro right. probably remember how they how they got their country well i'm just gonna let it go then and i, I really appreciate the analysis you guys retweet the space donate when you can honestly it's the best. Thank you. Oh, and we've got, it's, oh, we have several. So actually, Ander, you've got your hand up, but we're going to go to George and then we'll go to you, Ander, if we may. Thank you very much. George. No, go, go to Ander. She might be answering this question. Okay. And here's the thing. So is, is my, are my headphones, is my mic still scratchy? No. How weird is that? I have no idea. Maybe my charger? I don't know. Anyway, Anda. All right. So, um, what the, I, I heard uh, CND uh, fella, um, and I, I tried to, to come up and uh, answer. Uh, actually, Word Doggo did, uh, did answer for me. Um, basically, for, for the people in the room who um, are not familiar with um, Europe history, and especially with Eastern Europe history, um, in 250 years, uh, let, let's put it this way, so um, Ever since you signed uh, the, the Constitution in in United States, um, we changed borders at least a dozen times. Um, and um, <laughs> that was due to wars, uh, due to um, land disputes, um, various. Um, Romania used to have uh, um, um, some territories lost them, uh, gained some of them back, uh, lost them again, um, gained some others, um, lost them again, uh, and so on. So um, it's at any point in time, um, it would be very hard to define. Um, this is actually why after Second World War, uh, we said these are the borders, we will stick to them. Because at any given time in, in the past, there was a different border. Um, and uh, that is valid with Ukraine, that is valid with uh, uh, Hungary, that is valid for uh, Poland, for uh, Lithuania, and, and uh, so on and so forth. So um, each of those um, nations had different uh, reaches during uh, during time, different times, and you cannot go back far enough in order to say this is the correct way, this is the correct border, this is the correct thing we should go back. 
So this is why we decided uh, we gonna stick to these borders. Uh, yes, we have, all of us have uh, um, native uh, um, citizens uh, from, from, so Romanians who live in, uh, in Transcarpathia, uh, in the northern part of, of Romania, in, in uh, Baia Mare and Maramureș uh, region, we have uh, Ukrainians, Ukrainian nationals, um, um, there are also Hungarian nationals, uh, both in, in Transylvania and in Transcarpathia. So it's very hard because the, the land per se changed uh, uh, hands so many times. It's very hard to say, um, um, yeah, it's, it's more Ukrainian than Romanian, it's more Romanian than Hungary, it's more Hungary than, than Ukraine, right? And I'm taking this small area, which is Transcarpathia, where you have all three nations and, and not only. So after the Second World War, when the borders were, uh, uh, were, were, were put on paper, we agreed to stick to them, right? And all we uh, ask of our neighbors is for them to treat well our um, national, nat national uh, um, people. And this is the same, they have the same requests uh, for, for, for their national um, living in our country. Right, so being good neighbors, this is this is what's uh, what's it. Uh, it doesn't matter actually in which country they live, and there are free borders. Actually, you can cross, you can go in a different country and live in it. So, if at any given point someone from from Romania wants to uh, go and live in Ukraine, um, Ukraine is not gonna say no. And we have 50,000 Ukrainians living in Romania prior to this invasion, prior to, to um, the Maidan revolution. And they didn't say they want to go to Ukraine. Um, and they, they can do that, actually. And the Romanians who are living in Trans Transcarpathia, uh, they never said, you know, um, we want back in Romania. Actually, for, for most of the people who asked for Romanian citizenship, uh, and this is also valid for the Republic of Moldova, they could, they, they received it. So, uh, Maya Sandu has a, a double citizenship. She is a citizen of Mo Moldova. Uh, she's the president of that country, but she's also a citizen of Romania but she chooses to, to live in Moldova, and Moldova doesn't want to rejoin Romania. Uh, so... Uh, Would you like to basically add the word we're... or attribute currently? Cur uh, not necessarily. Um, for the last 30 years, they never, um, they never said they wanted what was to, different, to join Romania. What was different in the last 30 years? or the last 29 of those 30 years. What was different? Russian suppression was extremely effective and there was no full-scale invasion by Russia into Ukraine. And cryptocurrency, it is true. cryptocurrency money laundering and um, the influence of Sharif was overwhelming. It was, and that, that, that is very true. Um, and they do have a fairly large, because they, they, basically what they did in Moldova was what they did in Donbass. They um, taken out people from Moldova and they br brought in Russians, which means the Russian population after the Second World War increased from I don't know, 20% to 50%, something like that, more or less. Um, it's, <laughs> it, it, it was one of the reasons, right? It was one of the reasons, but going forward, actually what Moldova looks forward to um, is joining the European Union. They, um, they will benefit a lot from joining the European Union and actually the European Union 
as a union of states can help Moldova better than um, if Romania and Moldova um, join back together, right? So I think we all agree here, Andra. So yeah, <laughs> um, basically this is why I came up. Um, it's we kind of made peace. Uh, if mo if this makes sense, we made peace with the current layout of our borders, and th th that's one thing. Um, I I I learned about. Uh, you know, Axel, you you're gonna find this funny. I learned about a, a taxi driver in a taxi driver in Rome, who at some point being asked, you know, what's your opinion in um, Russia claiming uh, Ukraine as as their territory? He said, you know, the Roman Empire once uh, had. Um, every territory around the Mediterranean Sea. What about we claim them? So, <laughs> um, yeah. I think Ms. Meloni should make that appeal. It would unify all of Europe, um, the Mediterranean. It would definitely give the Azeris in Iran a possibility for an out. I actually quite like the idea. Morocco, Egypt could uh, essentially join. Obviously, the, the People's Front of Judea and the Judean People's Liberation Front, they would have to... Splitters. Deal. They were splitters. They would have to deal with each other. David, what have the Romans ever done for us? This is, I've, no, I have no idea. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Streets? Uh, they cover, cover the streets, did they not? Law and order. Oh, gosh. The, the aqueduct? Told Lead poisoning. <laughs> they only conquered us. They did nothing more than conquer us. Uh, that's the thing. Uh, on the eastern side of that divide in Frisia, they didn't conquer us. They actually... They no, killed. they didn't come there. They only <laughs> came there to, to trade. But they didn't. But they didn't come to fight us. They were. They were afraid of us. Exactly. Of course, when they tried for ninety years, they got buried. <laughs> and it was in Batavia that the first uh, first Roman uh, lost their uh, their uh, handles post. Their trade post. Yep. Trade contour. Right, David, now that we know that the Romans have never done anything for us, but maybe a little bit, and then they fortunately vanished, uh, and that they can't claim. And by the way, do you mind telling everybody at a later stage, it doesn't have to be today, but please prepare a two and a half hour special on the atrocities committed by Emperor Trajan and his forces against the Tra uh, Thracians because then you would probably uh, oh sorry you would probably then have to highlight the continuity of the gene pool because evidently it's very Roman is it not um yes and no uh, in all honesty Axel uh we were under um under under the Roman Empire for uh, <laughs> I will I will tell something funny after this. So we were under a Roman Empire for a couple of year a couple of hundred years, so 200 300 tops. Um, then they retreated from from uh, Dacia, what was then. The thing is like this. Uh, the... I like it when you call it Dacia. Is that the Dacia Sandero <laughs> lurking around the corner? <laughs> that was the name. Uh, <laughs> that was the ancient name of the Thracia. territory. So Thracia, Niagara. <laughs> Trach, tra uh, uh, Thracia, uh, uh, the Trach, uh, Jetodachi, yeah, Jetodachi, right? So yeah. 
Jet, Jet Odachi, uh, they were uh, from, from a, a bigger tribe which were called Trach. And uh, they were actually related with the Etrusks, which is the ancient, um, um, the ancient tribe uh, at the origins of, of Rome and, and um, one of them uh, of Rome and, and Italy. So it is supposed, because they didn't have uh, back then, they didn't have TV and media and stuff like that. And still the language um, developed pretty easily uh, into something that is very Latin. Um, so what they assumed later on was the fact that uh, the tribes were related and the languages were pretty much similar. So they didn't, they were like, uh, you going from, from one region of, of Germany to another, it's not identical, but it's sim similar, and at some point you can understand them better or worse. So that's, that's the theory that uh, emerged lately. During the, the 19th century, actually, because we were conquered and we were at risk of losing our identity, we kind of riled up around our language um, because we were the only Latins in the region and we kind of uh, took that as a point of pride, the fact that we have some Latin um, roots and the languages are so so similar. Um, so it's it's more of a political uh, explanation why it is it's called a, a Latin language uh, then uh, historically they were like cousins probably um, because otherwise you you cannot change the 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 base language of a country in 300 years uh, without any kind of media of of any kind so the only requirement was for them to uh, speak the the um, Latin language with the officials. That was that was it. So, the 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 general public didn't need to the the peasants the the trader uh, trade traders. Uh, they didn't need exactly to know um, Latin um, in extenso, um, and the language are very similar. So I can understand the person speaking in Italian pretty, pretty well. Um, and as opposed with the German tribes, right? Um, which have an entirely different language. Um, the German so, tribes? Yeah. yeah, there were German tribes. This is, this is how, historically, this is how they are called. I know. You have to tell this to people <laughs> because they take you seriously. If, they, if I tell them what the history of Central Eastern, Northern, Northeastern, and Southeastern Europe would be, um, they'd all go nuts. Why is that? Because it's the conundrum of this vast, vast area of Europe that uh, the migration of the peoples from the Northeast, Far East, from what is uh, Mesopotamia and the likes, has and the Indo-Germanic movements as uh, in the south and and all the way up to the north northeast, whilst the Ugric movement came from the north northeast and the north east east, that these two overlapping movements uh, co-joined with the Tatars in between, has shaped the world up until the Habsburgs tried to register it and failed. You know, I may be wrong, but my my history memories say the root of the uh, British ruling house, even now, is the um, it's the house of Hanover. Eh, Am I? Eh, it's Saxon Gotha. <laughs> Hanover, they were there, but the, the, then Saxon Gotha takes over. But and uh, David would tell you that the house of Hanover or the 
that part of the strength of um, those chaps was not necessarily very successful. But the Saxon Gotha thereafter, when married into it, improved the overall guidance, as you could see with Victoria and Albert. David is suspiciously uh, silent. I oh, uh, that, that would be why. Uh, so the uh, uh, so I said technically it is the House of Hanover, but yeah, Saxon Gorta, uh, it's different. Uh, uh, but uh, I, but, but I'm, I'm pretty certain they don't call it the House of Saxon Gorta. It is Saxon Gorta over here. It's actually, it is not the but, House uh, of Hanover. It's Saxon Gorta, and but it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's a family. I, 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 I'm just, I'm just saying. And where, where is, just for the people in the room, where is Hanover uh, situated? It's in Lower Saxony. It's in Germany. So, no, for, in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> it is in Germany. So Hanover is in Germany, the, the ruling house of, of uh, the British Empire, and um, which actually rules for the, for the last, 900 years um yeah, it, 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 it's that's a, not fair they, they came later there's a there's a couple of dutch people in there aren't there <laughs> they're not dutch uh, yes <laughs> there was something i mean there's, anyway, a, there's a people from everywhere uh, th this brings uh, uh, us ba back to the, the question of uh, from the germanic lowlands what are they doing there Well, they were conquering, right? Uh, why, why, why did I bring this up? Uh, just to point out that uh, our histories are interconnected, yet different, um, <laughs> and we we still have some conundrums on on some parts of them. Uh, but it's very hard to uh, to go back. How back? How how how? How far back to go in order to know uh, where were the borders? We we don't know, uh, and some some areas, some regions are very mixed. So we decided uh, in common ground that we will keep and uphold the borders, and this is what Ukraine is defending right now. They are defending their borders that were recognized legally um, around. Um, around the globe so um, and they have a right to defend them uh, so so that's that's um, that that was my point and and uh, that's that's where I wanted to go that, that's how I wanted to go back <laughs> basically to uh, what we were discussing earlier so um, Can I just help uh, David, just for the sake of good order, I just sent it to you. David, you will find out that uh, Georg, um, Georg Ludwig, uh, August 1714, is the first uh, representative of the House of Hanover after uh, Queen Anne. And, uh, and I'm and just saying what we call it. I'm just saying what we call it. That, that, I mean, if you if you want to call London Londinium, then 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 feel I free to do that, I mean, no, right? No, no. I, I was just <laughs> I was just praising Ando for the for the smart comment that everything in Europe in that regard, both on both a noble nobility level as well as especially much more importantly in um, merchant uh, say in the merchant classes and in the um, craftsmen who were traveling since medieval times quite quite widely actually is extremely intertwined and overlapping that's the only thing i was trying to highlight uh, a wunderbar g-man's got a hand up and then after that i i I've got something uh, that was uh, interesting for you to think. Of. I don't do not uh, know if you've seen it. Have you seen David Sachs last? Oh, I say last. His his uh, tweet, re uh, a recent tweet. Have you seen that? 
And, and when I said that, and all these hands turn up, maybe they, everyone else has seen it. Uh, if you haven't, Axel, I will, I will, I will send you a link. Please do so. G-Man. Right. Uh, good evening. Um, again, uh, and uh, that was again tremendous. And you know, uh, this war started, and I didn't know very much about Ukraine and less about their history. And I'm a historian, so I set about rectifying that uh, using a number of sources, like Sergei Plochy's The Gates of Europe, and like uh, so many of Mr. Schneider's books and the lectures that he put on YouTube, or Yale put on YouTube, and you know, he delivered most of them 23 lectures, which I've now watched, I think, three times. Um, they were that good. The history of Ukraine is just like the rest of the history of Europe. It's intertwined. There's so many wonderful segues, such as the fact that an Anglo-Saxon princess married one of the Grand Dukes of Kiev, Vladimir Bonomark. I think I probably not pronounced the second name right. Uh, or Vladimir. Uh, another, um, I'm getting somewhere with this, but bear, so bear with me. Another you know, Grand Prince, Yaroslav the Wise, was, found, uh, was named, or nicknamed, the father in law of Europe. So many, because he uh, was interested in marriage alliances. He was himself married to the daughter of the King of Norway. Uh, or was it Sweden? Anyway, one of the two. Um, his daughter became the king, queen of France, Anna of Kiev. The other daughter became uh, queen of Hungary, I'm going to say. Um, and a lot of his sons were also married into European royalty. Much like the British royal family also did. Uh, so I found an article just in light of the latest bit, um, an article here in the Telegraph from the 29th of March, so quite current, Camilla Tomlinny, who associate editor, but used to be the royal editor, um, and royal correspondent. How German the royal family actually is. Oh, well, how, <laughs> how German is it? Queen Victoria Only since was 1714, G-Men. Yeah, well, let me let me continue. Um, not too long. Um, Queen Victoria was famously known as the grandmother of Europe, and it was her marriage to German Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg and Gufa that cemented the British monarchy's German ties, which started, uh, according to this, in 1714 when George the First of Hanover, sorry, George the First of Hanover, sorry, George of Hanover was crowned. King George the First of United Kingdom, an English king who barely spoke any English, much no, not unlike the going back a few uh, hundred years, uh, the first Norman he spoke king. Didn't speak. Which, he spoke Lower he German, which was so similar to English that it was easy for him to communicate with his court. Thank you, indeed. Queen Victoria's grandson, George V, supported, succeeded Edward VII as king in 1910. He married Maria von Teck, who had German blood. But his reign obviously coincided with the First World War against his cousin, the German Emperor Wilhelm II. Uh, so not, not un, quite understandably, attitudes to Germany soured during that war. So George, II, uh, George V changed his family name to Windsor and renounced all German titles, as did his cousin Ludwig von Battenberg, who re renamed his family Mount Batten. Prince Philip came from this family, and when he married George V's granddaughter, Queen Elizabeth II, he also relinquished his German title of nobility. But, yeah or yet, he had predominantly German ancestors and spoke fluent German. He wanted both sides of his family represented when he was led to rest, and as a result, three of his German relatives were among the 30 hand-picked guests at his funeral at Windsor Castle in 2021. 
Bernard, Bern, Bernhard, sorry, the hereditary prince of Baden, 52, was the grand, who was the grandson of Philip's sister, Theodora, was present along with Donatus, who is prince and head of the House of Hesse, into which the late Duke's sister, Cecile, married, and Prince Philip of Hotenloch Langenberg, who is the grandson of Philip's elder sister, Princess Marguerite, was also present. I'm not going to go up any further than that. Um, the other thing, I don't know if anybody's ever watched the British television um, series, Who Do You Think You Are? Of course we did. And if you Boris happen to Johnson. watch Boris Johnston, exactly. then you find that he has not only Turkish ancestry, but, but he is related to an ancestor of George the Third Wurttemberg. England. Prince of Wurttemberg. Yes. Axel's memory is much better than mine. Um, I plead my illness, which gives me brain fog for um, for my deficiencies in this, but I'm glad that Axel's here to be my <laughs> I was so happy that you brought this up, Jim, and thank you so much. It was very nice that you did this. And you're very welcome. Uh, the last thing I want to say is around Ukraine. When I... So, not knowing much about Ukraine, I didn't want to be like Prime Minister Chamberlain, who called the Czech, Czechoslovakia a faraway place of which we know little, which wasn't true for him at all. It was a convenient lie. So I didn't want to be like that about Ukraine either. So I went on a journey to learn some. And I actually find the best way of doing that is to write about it. And I've tweeted that. And some people in this space have read that and retweeted it and so forth. Um, I found quite useful, among other things, the encyclopedia of ukraine.com, online encyclopedia, uh, as a sort of starting point for my journey of my quest for knowledge. Um, but to Anders point, you know, the civilized part of this world after 1914 and the disaster that that brought, and especially after 1939 and the World War II, decided that we weren't going to do this anymore. Countries' borders were not to be changed by the force of arms and the, the, the rules-based order was supposed to stop that and isn't perfect because it's made by humans and we're not perfect. But it did try. Um, I mean, even the country that I live in is divided and only 30 odd years ago in 1998 when we had the twin referenda on the Good Friday Agreement did the southern part, the southern poli polity that is, I'm just going to call it Ireland because that's their legal name, recognise that their official claim in their constitution, Articles 2 and 3, that claimed jurisdiction over the northern part of the country of the island, which is more properly named Northern Ireland, wasn't right. It was no longer right in a modern democracy to claim another part. And that self-determination is key. Unfortunately, not every country in this world that takes part in the UN recognizes that self-determination is the thing that trumps everything else, and say Trump as a metaphor, not as a name of a person. So self-determination and sovereignty should be key to making decisions of people. And, and also, we're not really into seceding unless there are tremendously valid reasons that outweigh the human rights of the people that are left behind if there's a secession being altered. So that's a long speak. I'm going to take some briefs. I'm going to take some breaths and be quiet. Slava Ukraini. Haram Slava. Thank you very much, Jima. Uh, uh, the, uh, 
Uh, uh, I'm, get, I'm going to, to defer to mockers anyway, because uh, we uh, we know what would happen if I didn't. And then Ming, then Kerry. She would set the cat on you. Yeah, which actually wouldn't really be a punishment. That would be a, oh, cat. Well, I, I will just interject with a little cat story. Um, does anybody... Meow know who i'm talking about when i call um him lookout cat there is a soldier who's a lookout and he has his little sort of um white and multicolored cat that sits with him and he usually wears a little vest or a little uh jumper or something uh, i've like seen that. him yeah well the cat went missing three days ago it was yeah come exactly. back Ooh. but he's come back today Hey, was he was he Russian mousing? No, um, he'd gone off and apparently found himself a girlfriend and was um, in the second line of trenches uh, with his chum. Uh, and the guys from the trenches recognised him and rang the guy and said, would you like your cat back? And he was like, yes, please. Um, then he's posted a picture of the cat back with him with uh, an air tag attached to his colour, so I have a feeling he, he won't be going missing too far any anymore. Oh, that's very funny. That's very funny. Yes. Cat cat goes and does what it wants. <laughs> now, that, who would have thought that, Mockers? Who would have thought? Does he wear a hat? I mean the cat, of course. Sorry. Um, yeah, he wears lots of items. He, he's quite he's quite the uh, clothes horse, is the cat. So he's a cat and a hat. Thank you. Anyway, that was wonderful. Uh, the, uh, so... David, is some... What exactly is going on with your microphone, David? I think it's his, his headset. He had this problem so an hour ago. Or Elon, Elon Musk is pushing the button. No, I think... David, is it possible that the headset is running out of steam? All right. We can't hear him, so let's go to Ming, and then Carrie, then G-Man. Uh, thanks, Axel. Yeah, no, Axel, I've been to Hanover a, f a few times. Um, you yeah, know, me too, many to, times. Yeah, m like you probably to visit uh, 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 my erstwhile collaborator and... I lost you. Yes, we lost me. It seemed terribly familiar. There was this coat of arms. We didn't everywhere. hear you. I Ming, mean, you were gone for 20 or 15 seconds. Could you be your Can... erstwhile collaborator and then that was gone? Uh, my erstwhile collaborator and or competitor, the Nord LB. Could, could you hear that? I did hear that. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, anyway, but I always felt curiously at home because everywhere I went, there was this coat of arms that was incredibly familiar to me. So I, I, I welcome the day when Lower Saxony recognizes its rightful ruler and returns to the fold. Meaning returns to Saxony, where it belongs, uh, because the house of Gotha is the one which actually overcame the barons of Saxony and the Duke of Saxony, and therefore Gotha takes over, which is completely fine by me but then also integrates um, the islands uh, to the north? <laughs> oh, they're insulin. Oh, you mean, you mean. <laughs> okay, so I the, see what family, you mean. the family tree is slightly bigger. The, the head of the family is not the monarch in Britain, as you may know. No, no, I know that. I know that. So there you go. If you say integration and return to the fold, then... I'm, I'm completely fine with Britain returning to the fold of the family of Saxon Gotha. If you really all want that, please. I thought you had a very good constitutional monarchy with a, you know, fully integrated democracy and everything else. First past the post, good decision making process and the likes. But hey, nuclear umbrella, you know, good hardworking people. 
I, I thought that was good enough. But if you really wanted, I'm sure we can find someone of the House of Saxon Gotha who's willing to assume, you know, overall dominion. Let's ask Mockers whether she's in favour of that and then go to Kerry. Mockers, would you like to be, you know, reintegrated into the fold? I'm not sure which fold you're talking about. Uh, the House I, of I, I don't Saxon think Gotha, which actually is, is uh, say, you know, in rules and therefore integrates what is currently the British monarch, British monarchy and its family. I'm going to say no comment. Uh, please go to Kerry. I have with delightful, uh, with, with delightful levity and uh, swiftness. I shall do so. Kerry. Hello, Axel. How's the night gardening? Anywhere I'd like to be. Um, do you know, I have just finished the night gardening. I um yeah, having a little break for the day now. I've been hard at it all day. Is, is it is, is there something as like pruning the cucumbers at night which makes this so No, I have been pruning the next door neighbour's apple tree. So um Oh yes, right, and that is seen... hanging across your fence, right? Yes. Okay, well yes. then that is of but... course within your realm of um uh, possession. Yeah. Well, she's an 84-year-old lady, and I'm missing her a lot. So you bring her the apples darling. in the morning out of the sheer courtesy well, no, and she's, deep love of you. Unfortunately, she was my icon. She's moved to a care home, but she was an absolute warrior. And um, so her family are doing the house up, and in respect of her, I'm doing a bit of work on her house for her. Cause I With know that kind of garden. neighbourly spirit, you could be either English or Ukrainian. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I've got I've got a number of things. I've got three things which I will highlight very briefly, and one of them may catch the attention, and possibly something you want to be something you may want to take down the road and kick about. So one is um, head of the TikTok battalion. We all know who that is, Ramzan Kadyrov has gone online to refute all claims about his death, together with his buddy, Dilemma Knopf, um, saying that he... Um, he that is shameful, uh, shamefully unhelpful. Yes, yeah, so he basically allegedly staged his death to perform the Hajj to the Mecca. And he really we should, like we should ask, walk we from should ask one our side correspondent. of a room to another. <laughs> Kerry, we should ask our correspondent <laughs> from Cairo whether that makes any sense in any form of any sort. <laughs> so that's one that's worth maybe digging into and taking the mickey out of. Another is a more serious one. So prior to Biden turning up at Vilnius, he is going to, and this is quite interesting, Great Britain and Finland. So that's an interesting choice. And then the third one is the spokeswoman for the Operational Command South, Natalia Hermaniak, um, has said that the number of guided bombs used by the RUAF has now decreased due to the fact that there are fewer recently produced bombs and the use of old bombs may not be safe for aircraft. So there you go. Take your pick. It's a pick and mix. I'll take the aircraft. Thank you, Kerry. Much appreciated. Please bring the apples to this wonderful woman in the nursing home. Uh, Marcus, are you ready now? You know me, I'm, I'm always ready for something. Good. Um, sure. I, I have a little tale for you. I have a little tale for you. Although, for some reason, it hasn't kept it in my bookmarks because, you know, that's how Twitter's behaving today. Bless you, Twitter. Anyway, here we go. Um, the story is about Prigozhin's business empire and um, just, you know, what, what's been happening with the people who worked for him. Uh, a little bit of a tale of woe. So um, it's obviously being rapidly dismantled. We've spotted that. Um, and lost the contract to provide um, food, if you can call it that, um, sort of rotten, gross, 
manky food to the Russian army. And his media empire is closing down as well. However, thousands of staff appear to have been made redundant without any pay. So, uh, until his mutiny last month, the Concord Group was Russia's mi military biggest food supplier. The Russian government paid it 845 rubles under a contract with the Russian MOD's procurement arm. Um, and that has now been cancelled. Concord also has the most dubious title of being the MOD's most sued contractor, with 560 lawsuits being filed in 22 alone for supplying the Russian army with food contaminated with. There's a list. Bacteria, insects and worms and scams such as substitution of ingredients. Um, Lookout News reports that Concord's many holding companies have been working intermittently since the 23rd of June and have been waiting for inspections, destroying documents um, and uh, generally tidying things up by order of the management. Um, it was expected that the entire document flow should have been handed over to the new owners on the 15th of July, but yesterday the employers the employees were told because of the breakdown of the contract between Vontorg and Concord, they would be dismissed instead. Concord's several thousand employees who were engaged in feeding the military and supplying food to hospitals and to occupied areas of Ukraine have been dismissed with resignation letters which are communicated verbally and no severance pay. It is unclear what uh, impact this will have on uh, military food logistics in occupied Ukraine, but uh, the situation is already reportedly quite bad, with frontline troops complaining they lack basic food and water. It's unlikely that Concord services will be replaced immediately. Similarly, Prigozhin's Patriot Media Group has shut down virtually overnight. Four sources have told Lookout News that employees of the group's outlets, which include RIA, FAN, Novetsky Novosti, Ekonomika, Sergodinya, and other publications were were told to stop working from 3 p.m. on the 30th of June. <clears throat> a now former employee of one of these publications says that the editor-in-chief announced their dismissal and promised they would get their remaining salary and severance pay. The employees of his media companies reportedly went out to celebrate a wake of the company. Afterwards. If I worked, I was going to say, Marcus, if I worked in that company... Yeah. I would have been taking, I would have been getting a trolley, a very big trolley, and taking every computer with me because it's the only way I'd be knowing I was going to get paid. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, one employee said, We've been having to work remotely all week. Then the website was blocked. A couple of days later, the VK page was blocked. We were left with only our Telegram channel. We've been told since Monday that maybe. That will be unblocked and we'll keep working. And today the message came through, we are closing, wages will be paid. And that was it. They so, can cut yeah. out the middleman and go straight for the worms and the insects on the front line. Get a bit of protein in there. Well, you can eat worms. It's, it's not awful for you. It won't kill you. Just a bit gross. Uh, put them in water. They clean themselves out, so you get the mud out, and then you could, if you've got some eggs, you can make a, a worm omelet. I have seen that done in, um, yeah, some sort of army training thing where they were basically like, "Now, now it's time for dinner, guys. Off you, off you go. Enjoy," and gave them a big tub of worms and some eggs. <laughs> They didn't make them go. I you said, know, this is easy time. You had to go and find your own worms. That was, that was the point of giving them the worms. Find them. And 
Oh, they must have been the REF, right? That's why they got they were given the stuff. What is your problem with the ref, Simmons? It's just nothing. Uh, nothing. But it was easy time. Ah, easy time and easy company. This is how the Royal Engineers have us went away. You know, there were easy companies firing heavily at others in uh, woods at very, very low level fire range and short fire range in the midst of Bastogne. And this easy company just had it too easy. David, oh David, where shall we go? Let's go to g -Man. A quick question, Axel, just on the royal family thing, and uh, I think we should close this topic, but um, the House of uh, Saxe Coburg go no, far. Go to, what is Saxe Coburg? It's a different house. Well, whatever one. Anyway, they're massively um, different. What they're actually is their succession policy? Is it still the male descendant only? Actually, that's the interesting part. Uh, Saxe Gotha actually allowed at the end of the 18th century uh, for female heirs to uh, say appear in the register if no other male born was alive or illegible. Now, illegible, that's the interesting thing. Technically, you could actually take someone who has been born by the king's consort rather than the king's spouse to be ineligible. And things like this have been used in the past. Don't forget, the nobility cheats. Yeah, yes, indeed. Well, you see, we in Britain cannot, unfortunately, and much as so we'd like to, possibly, take up the offer because the British royal family enacted legislation which allows for equality among the small select, I'll give you, group of children of the current monarch. Uh, thus, but what is the problem with the children? King Charles, I'm sorry, uh, Demon, who's the King William? Because Demon, uh, what is the problem with the Harry's children? Harry's an absolute parcel. Um, also, then uh, William's eldest is Prince George, as it happens, so he will be king. But if uh, Princess, no, 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 what's her name? Maybe we can bring focus. Demon, sorry, what is the problem with? The children of the current yeah we just can't we can't come under that house because they don't recognize that girls can be queen ahead of boys what you That's had a, the law. you just had a queen for how long mate the only daughter of the king so what's your point then? two daughters right the eldest daughter of the king tends to become the queen but they've changed it so that whoever is the oldest whether it be a girl or be a boy, becomes the next monarch. I, I do not know what they may or may not have changed, and that's completely fine. But then, as I told you, nobility cheats. But the House of Saxon uh, Gotha has a specific rule, and I'm quite sure that at some point in time, the um, uh, slightly outlandish behavior of the English uh, cousins in the substream will be brought back into the fold. Don't forget, monarchs, and specifically in this case, houses of nobility, do not contend with current streams. They contend with transcendent history. So we're not talking one or two generations and a few hundred years. You really need to get this in check. Anyway, uh, before we do this, uh, the, I'm going to remind everyone, uh, it would have been the first tweet in the nest, except for G-Man stuck a tweet in there. Anyway, we'll, t we'll discuss about that later, G-Man. Uh, but they, if you look at the second tweet in the nest, everyone, there is a tweet there. I do this to make it easy for you all, and so I can track who isn't doing this as well. Just now, uh, see? not i'm not so silly as i look right so if you go to that tweet tweet it like it share it boost it so we can get some more people in
that would be amazing. And I'm also going to follow a couple of other things. As you know, right, we also do good things for other people, right? And that's, I say mainly, that's solely uh, uh, people about Ukraine, right? And we do have some fundraisers, many fundraisers. I'm not going to go through all the all, all of the things we've done. There's many, and that you could get, uh, Yehuda will probably name every single one of them. Uh, all, you, all we know is it's a lot. And we do um, occasionally ask people for some donations. If you have uh, the wherewithal for a donation, that would be amazing. Um, if you go to mariareport.org, there's a donate button and you can donate there. Thank you very much. But importantly, go to the second tweet in the nest. You'll see it. I'll read it out to you and make it easy. It's prime time somewhere on Maria Report. Uh, Baltic Snow Tiger, me, and that's DM Brookfield, are talking Ukraine. Pop up, ask some questions such as, why can't David Sachs do maths? That's a question we should go for. So, uh, Because he sacks at math. Yes, exactly. <laughs> see? See? Someone got it. Right. I'm not sure whether he will. But anyway, uh, the uh, yeah, retweet it. Get the name out. Let's get some more people in here. And with that, David Sachs. Uh, Axel? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is a long story and a long history with David Sachs, which I will not repeat here because I've had this discussion before, both public as well as in smaller circles. And the level of disappointment, which always goes hand in hand with people who just are incoherent, inconsistent and intellectually dishonest, despite the fact that they could be better at it uh, because they are unwilling, they are happy, they are complacent with what they may or may not have gained at some point in, time in their lives. There is a wonderful story by a very, very decent chap, you know, who once said that the, many people extrapolate from whatever kind of uh, gains they've made in life that they are the exponent of truth and justice as well as general genius over other centuries decades years months weeks or even minutes despite the fact that their success is based on something which happened in the past which may or may not have been <sighs> due to both a combination of luck, happenstance, and their availability to prove whatever meager talent they may have had at that point in time. I think that says it. Uh, but anyway, I still don't know who J David Sachs is. Go on, tell me, explain to me, what is it? I mean, he, he must be something special. He has a lot of followers, Axel. And we well, know that how that from my counts. Point of view, uh, Mr. Sachs uh, is uh, a young man. Yes, David Sachs. He's a young man. He is actually the funny thing is he was once, and uh, this is a long time ago, when, when he and Elon invaded um, um, what can only be described as. Um, PayPal's upgrade. So um, he's a Western Union. guy. Well, he's a he's a venture capital chap at that point in time, and he manages to take his uh, well, not inconsiderable wealth at that hand uh, to put in uh, to uh, PayPal. The thing is that he was not necessarily completely, utterly, um, shall we say bereft of capability. He's a highly, highly, highly focused young man at that point in time. However, he also only went into voodoo economics and how to make other people suffer, i.e. law. And uh, as a consequence, um, he never studied anything in addition to the, these two things, which matters. No science, no physics, no math, no chemistry not even god forbid biology or biochemistry as a part of it no none of this so and as a consequence whilst well educated uh he went directly to mckinsey and after a year at mckinsey he simply uh, sacked himself from the job to join uh 
friends and colleagues at uh, PayPal. And that is in the heydays, if you remember, up until 2001, up until the, 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 the complete and utter depletion of the um, web boom at that point in time, people went like maniacs, like flies, uh, all for the same honey. And he did this and he went with PayPal. And he managed to get out of PayPal on time. He did extremely good work. There's no question about it. He did it well. And that's fine. But that's it. So you could say uh, our friend um, Chuck would probably call him a good surfer. And that's true. He surfed away. Did he invent anything? No. Did he change anything? Not necessarily. Did he manage a process en route or brought en route by other people? Absolutely. No question. Does that qualify him for good guidance as to military matters? Not necessarily. Does success in business necessarily mean that? No, it doesn't. Not at all. Is he good at managing networks? Sure. Absolutely. No question. He's done reasonably well. He's done um, what people call seed and early stage or uh, angel investments on a number of very good uh, placements of all the names which you would know from, I don't know, name it what? Airbnb, Palantir, the likes, Facebook, whatever, anything, SpaceX, the likes, because they're all hanging about the same circles. So, and he managed to raise funds and he did this well and he's made money. There's no question about it. That does not mean that in any shape or form, he is necessarily a very smart guy. Not at all. Because smart is not good enough anyway, but he's definitely not wise because if he were wise, he would certainly not donate to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I'm sorry. He just wouldn't. Well, yes. So what you're really saying is he got lucky, moved to the right place and had some mates no, 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 and made he, himself he worked hard. wealthy. He, 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 he managed, this is not, no, no, that's not fair. That would never be fair. I would never say this. As I highlighted before, he worked hard, he worked smart, he managed to be at the right time. If you listen back to what I said earlier, he, the thing which I would criticize about him is that he extrapolates from having had success on other matters to having authority on matters which really matter. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's a, a mistake many do, isn't it? They believe uh, that their self-worth is relative to their earnings and therefore whatever they say about pretty much anything uh, uh, that ha uh, matters and uh, it's uh, quite often very very wrong right uh, well so i'll just say this again david Sachs. and with that Gmail. can we can we just make the little switch so that the beautifully quaffed alors brewer uh, the wonderful follower of French fashion and great sunglasses can come up and I bring him up here to go host. Did you call on me or uh, am I waiting? <laughs> I called. No, I, well, I, I did say G, man. Okay. Let me be the first to welcome that. Um, Estimable, uh, estimate, inestimable, actually. Um, X paperboy to the stars. Hey, I'm talking about the Campbell family now, the uh, Campbell soup. Uh, Alan Brewer, come on down. I feel like I'm on a game show, or maybe uh, this is your life, something like that. Yes, I, I, do, you, do you want me to interview you there, Alan? Alan. Uh, do you remember when you were six and your and your most favorite school teacher? Do you remember? 
Uh, yes, I do. Uh, when I was well, we six... don't have your favourite school teacher. We've got oh. the one that gave you six of the best. They... <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man! Oh Jesus, David! Well done. The... <laughs> the... That was epic. And... And and there is the game show applause track. Uh, not that this is your life was a game show. It wasn't. But, uh, David, I think there's a future for you in 1950s television. I think there was. <laughs> oh, well, anyway, Alan, welcome. Welcome there. And uh, the, the sto I very much enjoyed the stories of how naughty you were at school. Yeah, I could have I could have learned to be naughtier, actually. <laughs> this is the problem with my whole life, David. I never learned to be really, really naughty. Uh, right. Well, that, here's the thing. I mean, maybe if we met halfway, we might have got a normal person. Then, Alan. <laughs> yes. If only I'd had time to spend with you in Berlin trying to get across uh, the checkpoints, my life would have been remarkably different. Oh, that's <laughs> triggering, David. David. Oh, no, no, no. I told everyone. There's a, I've, I've limited myself to a number of my stories. And, uh, yeah, but I'm pretty certain we're coming up to a time when I might be able to repeat another one. It, it's okay at your age, David, to be repeating stories. I that do way, that on a daily basis. Yes, but it helps your memory because the more you repeat the same story, the less likely it is you'll ever forget it. Yeah, you're all temporary. That's how the memory works, isn't it? Yes. Anyway, so, uh, oh, uh, sorry, you said something, Gina. Yeah, sorry for interrupting. It's called neuroplasticity in the sort of sciencey. Geeky bit um, on the internet. Oh, thank you very much. I, I have neuroelasticity. My brain just snaps back and forth all the time. You never know what in the world I'll remember or what I've forgotten. I mean, why are we here, Alan? Come on, remind me. Why are we here? Uh, give me a moment, David. Oh, yes. Uh, we are here. Uh, in fact, we are here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, we aren't here that often, but Maria Report is always on air to support Ukraine, uh, to bring more people information they need, and to broadcast Ukrainian voices. We now know so many people in Ukraine uh, and, and care about them so much. You know, some of them have... Uh, some of them have been you know, present in, in missile attacks and are, are recovering. Some of them are deputy mayors of cities like Kherson, uh, who appealed for help and Maria Report was able to give it because of the generosity of our listeners. That generosity has to keep going every single day because the needs, frankly, will never stop until Ukraine defeats Russia. So go to mariareport.org, tap on the donate button, and make a generous contribution. Thank you. David, how did I do? That was wonderful. In fact, I was go, it was double wonderful. So it was twice as good. Well, thank you. You know, I haven't had a chance for the last hour to listen to you and Axel, so I don't know what the topics have been. Uh, David I, Sachs. It, David Sachs, who, who the hell cares about David Sachs? He's a, he's a sack of something, that's for sure. He's a bag of, ugly, uh, an ugly bag of water. So, um, uh, mate, I, I will try not to shout David Sachs next time because I might start deafening some people, for which uh, the, I do apologize, uh, but the, um, that's what the mute button is for and mute me oh no you can't mute me can you all oh, right anyway uh, for which i still apologize i will try not to say shout david sacks again 
you know, may, maybe David, we can get a new control. Uh, mute your co-host. Yes, that would be good. People in the space permanently muting us. I have purely uh, come yes. up to say, Alan, I understand you were doing vanilla swearing the other day. Prince Heather was quite shocked. Princess Heather, Prince Heather was quite shocked. We were doing you. You were doing lots of vanilla swearing. I would never have thought it. Yes, I think I said FCUK more than once. That's a fashion brand. I I know it was, <laughs> but you know, this this is a family show. Uh, let's Sorry, let's go to G Man. Well, well, what's happening at your family table? You're not, I mean, plain spoken main English. Isn't it called yes, mainline? Yes, that's true. Oh God, no. <laughs> No, the, the main line actually was in Philadelphia. Uh, that's where uh, all oh, the, the rich folk lived. Oh, I forgot. The city of brotherly shoves. Yes, and in, in the summer, they came to the island where I grew up off the coast of Maine. And one little town where uh, they would arrive for the month of August, usually, we called Philadelphia on the Rocks. Uh, G-Man, save me from my past. Uh, okay, gladly. Um, I'm going to go to an email that I just got, and other than the one that I'm looking at, which is the USS Constitution by uh, Knight, which is nice, but it's not the one taken uh, on July the 1st, yesterday. Anyway, that's not, that's not it. We Are Ukraine have just sent me an email, uh, um, the heading of which is Russian shell Kherson region 86 times in one day on the 1st of July 2023. Just going to read out a few of the headlight, headlights, head, headlights, lines. The flag of Ukraine, that wonderful beacon of truth and freedom, is travelling from Bakhmut to the NATO summit in Vilnius. That's good. Ukrainian boxer Alexander Kraziak wins gold in boxing at the European Games in Krakow. That's also under the good... Ukrainian head, headwear, headwear, not headline, headwear, I hats, brand, Russian Baginski, see from The Hobbit, uh, received the Adam Fash and Dam Fashion Award. Okay, that's also under the good. Majority of the Ukrainian population believes in a better future and does not plan to leave their cities. The CIA director was in Ukraine on a secret trip. Not secret anymore, so presumably he's back home again. And a Briton has sold his house and moved to Ukraine to volunteer. This is something I'm going to have to click into to find out more information. More than 1,530 children were injured on, in Ukraine as a result of the full-scale armed aggression of the Russian Federation. That's definitely under the bad. And again, to repeat, under the bad, Russians shelled her song. 86 times in one day, July 1st, 2023, which means that Ukraine need to be sent long-range fires such as the Attactums as soon as possible. Slava, Ukraine. Hello, I'm Slava. Axel. I just have one thing for Gunny. Gunny, if you can hear us here, you will love this. Even the Wall Street Journal titles tonight, Brazil worries it has become a haven for russian spies infiltrating the west if this is not full-blown martins i don't know what is yeah well i hope gunny can come up if he is listening uh i had no idea brazil what had become a, a haven of of russian spies it has always been both a fascist uh, as well sorry both the hard right populists as well as the hard left, which is currently in power, um, with Lula, the in, uh, formerly rightfully pr imprisoned uh, thug uh, of the hardcore leftist, uh, I don't know, trade unionist uh, movement, um, Soviet um, curious. Uh, 
um, Che Guevara Afin, meaning another war criminal, by the way, just for you wearing your, your T-shirts, you can go and burn them. Because if you're wearing genocide on your T-shirt, you're just dumb. But having said this, Miss Martins is uh, the best example of a low-level, spirited, Twitterati idiot playing it for the Russians. But there you go. Yes, that's what uh, Brazil has become for a long time already, because it's uh, easy for them to get there and move their money across from other states. Venezuela is a very good infiltration harbor, as is Cuba into Brazil. And since Lula has come to power, things have gone yet back again to that. There's no anti-money laundering regulation in place. And they know exactly what to do. And both the Russian consulates as well as the Russian embassy support this, of course, but uh, the money comes in from Venezuela, despite the Brazilians denying that it does, and the Cubans bringing it in, as well as a couple of other sources. So, yes, this is how it goes. And we all failed in preventing it from happening because we allowed the Islamist nonsense going into um, Venezuela to support Chavez and others. Don't forget, there were many people on the American left very much in favor of people in Venezuela having such nice orchestras traveling around the world, purportedly supporting the wonderful youth education system under the previous governments. I remind every BBC listener and viewer of how the wonderful Venezuelans played. There you go. Stick it. A short uh, commentary on a few countries in Latin America there. Uh, thank you, Axel. I, I, it's I think that, that... It's all about the money trail. It's all about the power. The, the countries are permeable. That's the whole point. I think that's what, what you and I agree on since a long time. This is all permeable. It's not that there is some kind of a really heavy-duty barrier. That's the whole point. This is what authoritarian governments have done to the uh, wonderful countries of South America and Latin America for that matter, because we allowed this to occur. We were appeasing them. Unfortunately, the United States has never taken sufficient interest in Latin America or Central America. Um, and it's, it's come back to, uh, to haunt us. I mean, I can think all the way back to Nelson Rockefeller's trip to Latin America, which was a terrible failure. Uh, and at that point in time, this would have been, he would have been uh, Nixon's vice president, uh, I believe, at that time. Uh, his car was stoned. Uh, he was his life was was threatened. Frankly, I'm trying to remember what city that occurred in. I think it might have been i can't remember it was it was it was in one of those latin american uh capitals uh g-man go ahead please was yes, thank you. Uh, okay thanks um so i mentioned this earlier in the space in the afternoon session which was uh, particularly plagued by some issues, so much so that both the co-hosts couldn't hear or speak, and I tried to I tried to cover the period a little bit. Anyway, this is what it was. Um, I think it's an amazing, amazing story. Uh, shows the spirit of Ukraine in the Kiev region. Archaeologists are working. Imagine that, and they unearthed the wreckage of eight British fighters from the. Second World War. For three years, from 1941 to 1944, Great Britain handed over to the USSR about 3,000 hurricane, er, hurricane aircraft. Most were either destroyed in battle or dismantled for parts. However, some of these aircraft were specifically dismantled and buried by the Soviet military after World War II, so as not to have to pay for them because the terms of the lend lease meant that only intact weapons at the end of the conflict would have to be paid for. Uh, so Soviets being mainly at heart Russians, by which I mean thieves, um, buried them 
but they've been unearthed and they're going to be put into the museum in Kiev. Um, so I think that's quite nice. Thank you. Are we going to send the bill for those though? Because well, it's an send... unpaid bill, right? We well, send it to Moscow. I don't think we'll send it to Kiev. Oh no, that's what I meant. Send it to Moscow. I mean, the, and surely that that we should probably uh, i mean the, the, the people who committed that fraud probably aren't around anymore but or if only. maybe maybe just permanently seize the money that's embargoed and send it to keith how's that had a bit of interest what would that be one of our <laughs> I'll, I'll save a tax to work out the interest Well, uh, you know, I saw that story and uh, and read the reason uh, why uh, the Russians or the Soviets at that time uh, dismantled the planes or damaged them or or took spare parts that they needed to repair their washing machines. And it, it is just so typically Russian it, to <laughs> in order to avoid it paying a bill. I mean, it, it's no different than. Uh, running out of a restaurant leaving your bill unpaid uh and your and your waiter untipped it's about the same thing if you ask me which leads me to you just said that now i've suddenly i've i've been mulling over something uh alan um so now i think we've got the answer so uh, there was a report that 30 russian um i was going to say dig you can't call them dignitaries Russian with the word and their families, um, diplomats, I guess, are they diplomats, probably spies, have all have left Bucharest and have gone home. Do you think that's why they've got an unpaid bill? <laughs> they, they've gone home. Uh, yeah, I think that's exactly why. Uh... It, how, Romania kicked out what That's thirty it. or forty? And their families. Uh, yeah, uh, they they overstayed their welcome. That is certain. Uh, Ming, welcome and go ahead, please. Uh, thank, thanks, thanks, Anna, thanks, David. Uh, you know, uh, G Man, on that uh, hurricane story, the bit I don't get in all this, given you know what we know the Russians are capable of is why they bother to destroy them and bury them. Why didn't they just keep them uh, and just lie about, you know, that just say that they were all wrecked and that was that? They had actually inspectors from Britain over and across to take lists. Oh, so they physically had to hide them. Okay. But they could have just flown them to the Pacific. <laughs> there you are. Fly them away. There we are. <laughs> The answer is they're too dumb to think of that. Or they'd run out of fuel. But, uh, I mean, again, typical Russian behavior. Uh, commit a crime, uh, a war crime or a petty crime. It doesn't make any difference what the category is. Uh, and then lie about it or try to cover it up. It It's what they do. G-Man? Yes, uh, absolutely. I'm going to quote my favorite uh, sort of fictional U.S. president of the of the last sort of 50, forty years. Um, I'm talking about Jack Ryan, of course, who had a particular well, whose offer gave him a line to say in the books, um, which is, "War uh, of aggression is merely armed robbery writ large." There, Tom Clancy. That's uh, that's how Russia understands it. Uh, that's for certain. Uh, David, have we received any uh, military news today? I don't, so with that, I'm going to say no, uh, nothing really. Uh, although I am looking at a tweet. Uh, uh, that's, I mean, the, the, there's someone in the military in it, uh, um, uh, but I've not seen any any real news at all it's strangely silent i think uh, if i was the sort of person who would go onto telegram and the many other things that i would need to be able to do uh, i we i'd be looking to see if there was a lot of chatter on russian telegram at this point
Well, if there's not today, I'm, I'm sure there will be in 24 or 48 hours. It, it just looks like uh, things are about to happen uh, or are happening. Um, and Chuck will be with us on, on Tuesday evening to review all of that. Oh, that would be lovely. Yeah, that would be lovely. Chuck, you have tweeted something out about uh, Ulrich Heath axis. The last 24 hours, Ukraine forces are pressing contacts on the T0815 axis east of Beloria, driving south of the T0408 axis, Ukraine task. Elements are now reported in contact. 